hi and welcome. Uh, Donna and April, do you want to introduce yourselves? Uh, do you want me to go first? Go for yeah. it. Um, hello, my name is Donna. Um, I am a clinical lead occupational therapist um, for the High Dependency Rehabilitation Services. Um, and I am the head OT based at um, one of the rehab sites uh, in Salford Lodge, Signet. Hi, I'm April. I work with Donna. I'm a BOM5 occupational therapist that works in rehabilitation high dependency unit. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, as we've said, one of the things that we're talking about within this season is the new book that's been written. So Donna, you have led for that on the High Dependency Rehabilitation Service line. Um, and April, I know you've been a, a great support to Donna along with lots of other people who've been involved in writing that chapter. Can you tell us what it's like to work in that service line? Mm -hmm. um, so... I suppose rehabilitation, um, it's quite a, a generic term. And when people say rehab, what do they mean? Do they mean like physical health? Do they mean mental health? What do they mean? So re as an OT in rehab, um, you are the doer. You are the um, facilitator. You're the problem solver. You're the person who um, sees that person along that journey, assesses them, revisits that does lots of interventions with them, um, hopefully then consolidates that and supports them along their journey to discharge into the community to lead a more independent life. Um, and working in rehab is challenging. Um, it can sometimes come with a lot of barriers. It can come with a lot of challenge, like a lot of um, unexpected roadblocks, as we say sometimes, but um, as occupational therapists, we are the people that we are, we have to motivate the unmotivated sometimes. Um, and that is what we, I believe that's what we're, we're really strong at doing. Mm. So you touch there on um, working with people that aren't very motivated. Would you say that's the biggest challenge within this service line or, or are there other things that are, are more challenging perhaps? Mm, I think there is a, a couple of things that, um, that motivation is definitely one. Um, because how do you how are you able to motivate someone maybe sometimes to do the simplest of tasks and that could be something like brushing your teeth and getting up in the morning getting dressed um, having a shower to eventually maybe somebody at a different stage of their life where they want to have a job or um, access the community and things like that so motivation levels um, Motivation is, is, is a challenge, definitely, for sure. I'd say other challenges that we would come across would be sometimes um, having delayed discharges. Um, that is something that can um, impact uh, somebody's journey, um, especially if there is maybe a little bit of a delay on where they go after rehab. Um, so that can be a bit of a challenge sometimes because then that does in turn impact motivation levels. So you have to of keep course. that person going. Um, other challenges I think that we have in rehab, any other challenges you think that we would have? Well, I was thinking of positives as you're bringing up mm. the challenges as mm. well. Um, so when you were saying about you can do working with people from brushing the teeth mm -hmm. to getting a vocational role mm -hmm. that's the beauty of rehab as well so being able to sink your teeth into really juicy interventions and you've got the time mm -hmm. to really pick apart that intervention think yeah, what's exactly. working what isn't working try it again if it doesn't work mm -hmm. and you can really think outside the box with how you're going to work with that patient and mm -hmm. I think that's one of the best things about rehab yeah. as an OT. So if we're going to a little bit more detail about those challenges with uh, with motivation what what would your advice be? Uh, my advice would be to find out what makes that person tick. What is their interest? And we would do that through um, assessments that we would complete at the beginning. Um, and then through that, you would identify what interest that individual has. Once you've grasped that, um, and it might be something that you've never heard of before, um, then go, go away, do your research into it, um, and... Um, you have something then to start building that rapport with that individual. Um, I also think of uh, humour is a huge tool um, for for any clinician really, but for for mm. for myself anyway, um, to get people involved and participating in either one to one sessions or group sessions. Another thing that I think is really important is how we approach 
uh, individuals when we want them to participate in something. Um, we can ask someone if they want to come to a life skills session or participate in an assessment. Um, and sometimes, well, more often than not, sometimes you're, you're met with no. Um, and it's how we flip that on its head. It's how we change our style, how we are more encouraging. Um, not necessarily always accepting no as an answer for the first time um, and not giving up. It's really important um, to motivate the unmotivated, but try and find a different style to do that. Such a big part of the role, isn't it? April, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about maybe what it is that makes that so rewarding working within that client group. Well, I think, like I said before, because you're working with that person for so long, so touching in with the low motivation, some of the patients we work with might have been in and out of services for a while before they get to us and their confidence and self-esteem might be really low and you've got to work with them to build on that. So you work with someone at the start, they might have no motivation, they might not know what their interests are anymore outside a hospital and it's trying to build on that and as the time goes on and you go through the pathway you can implement those interventions and when they come out more confident knowing who they are and what they want to do it's just a really lovely experience and you can see the difference that mm. you've made and sometimes it might be a really subtle difference it's not always they've you know come and then they've had a job at the end of it sometimes it might just be that they've got their own morning routine mm. sort out and that's really nice as well mm. and it's just it's lovely to see mm, very rewarding mm. yeah mm. it's capturing those subtle differences yeah. isn't it and how we I guess really shout out to other members of the team and um, perhaps sometimes patients families or their care teams and and evidencing those really subtle changes mm. Um, and which, celebrating it as well, yeah. which is fantastic. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, Always. we have some uh, something that we do actually that we're rolling out across uh, the rehab sites, which is a way in which to celebrate. And it can be small, small things. Um, it might not necessarily be that someone has achieved a job or um, it could be that they came to a music session that week or they've come to... Um, uh, food from around the world group that week where they've been in their room for a few weeks but prior to that and not had the uh, co confidence to leave to leave their room um, so we do this thing where um, we call it a bloomer an OT bloomer um, and we'll display their picture um, on a on on like a wall on a board um in the main sort of lounge areas um and celebrate that and then we'll they'll, we'll offer them a prize as well during like community meetings and things um just to shout about it and and then they can get that peer support as well everyone gives them a round of applause and you know it's just something that's quite nice um and it is anything from literally brushing your teeth to having a job and that's what an occupation is you know. Absolutely. I think when we think about those bigger goals as well, you know, it's easy to refer back to um, those really harder to achieve goals, which, you know, sometimes people are expecting. We would never achieve them without breaking it down into those smaller tasks, would we? That's such a, a huge part of what we do is that starting with those smaller steps and, and building up those achievements over time, isn't it? Which is the skill development phase, and isn't it? So that's the second stage of our, our pathway. Um, and that probably is the biggest chunk of our pathway, I would say. Um, our pathway is split into four different sections. Um, it's approximately 18 months or so, give or take, depending on the individual. And the skill development bit is quite significant. Um, and we do, <clears throat> excuse me, we do spend spend a lot of time looking at breaking down tasks, activity analysis and things like that as well, mm -hmm. and confidence building and building your self-worth as well alongside that. So there's there's all the positive side effects that you get from um, developing skills. It's what, what does it do for your mental health? What does it do for your confidence levels? How does that person then feel when they're going to do that task again? Um, is it easier for them? Uh, hopefully it is, and that's what we want, you know. So before we move on to, to the next section, um, I know we've touched on this a little bit, but I wonder if we could just talk a little bit more about what it really looks like within that service line. So um, maybe thinking for an occupational therapist, what are you working towards with that patient group? Where are those patients coming from and, and what are they hoping to achieve as they move on from there? 
Quite often when, when someone comes to us, they've been through a lot of services. They may have been in and out of acute services for some time. Um, they may have had um, field experiences living in the community. Um, and they may have had um, a lot of, they may have experienced things which will be cause them to become de-skilled. So if you, people who come to us, I'm going to use the example of having a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Um, there are some negative side of symptoms that they may experience from that. So there's all the negative symptoms, there's all the positive symptoms. And it may be that they aren't able to do the things that they found important um, because of the nature of their illness and how that's impacted their levels of functioning. So when someone comes to us, um, they may have had uh, a lot of journey through different uh, services um, and our job as occupational therapists sometimes is to start from scratch um, and uh, look at what their baseline is and we would conduct various assessments to establish what that is. It may be that we need to press reset for individuals, it may be that we need to find um, what once we've established what their baseline is and then we ask the question can we build on this can we develop this is is that where we're going to get to can we take this any further so we start off our process in in rehab by doing a lot of assessments um gathering the information finding out about that individual um once we've done that then what we would do is we would look at developing their skills. So practice, 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 asset, and then revisit it, assess it if need be, but I'll all always practice. Um, and then once we've got them to a stage, hopefully, where we feel that their skills have improved and their levels of functioning have improved, we try to consolidate that, don't we? Yeah, so it's, it's trying to break it down and looking at the barriers of what's getting in the way of their mm -hmm. functional abilities. So what is it? What's causing the low motivation mm -hmm. or what's caused you to perhaps lose the skills that you used to have? And what can we do mm -hmm. to remove those barriers? Mm -hmm. Bit of problem solving at the start, mm -hmm. looking information gathering, mm -hmm. you, you know, going as far back as you can do mm. and then moving forward. Yeah, because I think sometimes with rehab, um, the word rehab itself, people stereotypically think of maybe drug or alcohol misuse, but we, we're not necessarily focusing on that. We're looking at the skills that individuals have lost as a result of mental illness. And then how can we regain those skills, find new ones, you know, um, and see them towards. And the beauty of rehab is that we've got that time. Um, and they may, might not have had that time in acute to to really work on those skills. But in rehab, we've got a nice long pathway where we can get our teeth stuck into it um, and really build on that um, to the point then where hopefully they can achieve things such as uh, participating in colleges, um, courses, um, met, setting up links in the community, um, obtaining employment. Um, one of the really good things about working at Signet is that we can actually offer people therapeutic earnings, which, I mean, historically, that's not something I'd ever um, been able to be a part of. The therapeutic earnings um, ties into our vocational aspect of rehab. So when um, someone has develop their skills in in a great way and, and we think right let's take that to the next step um we have roles such as dining room assistant tuck shop attendants community meeting chairs we've got all these amazing roles that we can offer in-house um and and they get paid as well there's really something to be said isn't there for for testing that out in yes. a safe environment exactly before we can then support somebody to take that out into yeah. the community yeah um you know the fact that they've already worked through that process and have some idea what to expect yeah yeah thinking about the model that we use mm. how has it been helpful to to apply that with that patient group and work through that model with them? Has that been helpful? Yeah, it's good for clinics, isn't it? It's fantastic. And because it's visual as well, for both the MDT as well and the patients mm. we work with, they can visually see where they are on the pathway. And it's very clear mm. what is needed and expected from each stage of the pathway and mm. to be able to move through it as well. Um, so it really breaks down what assessments are needed. And then in skills development, what skills we wanted to develop, mm. what might that look like? Is it group? work is it one-to-one -one interventions mm -hmm. 
than consolidation, more community-based stuff. Mm-hmm. What does that look like for people? Is it going to be a vocational role? Is it get more confident getting the bus to places and in, encouraging independence in that area? And then discharge and you've got your graded exposure, mm. all the lovely plans that we make. And I think because it's very clear, obviously more details in the pathway, patient can say, right, okay, in your ward rounds, let's look at the pathway. I'm at skills development. I know I need to do this. I've not done it. Let's mm. make our goals and work mm. towards it. Yeah. And it's not linear as well. Mm-hmm. It's great for goals. Yeah, setting. really it's good, good for goals. Setting. I mean, some people might get to consolidation and then there might be a deterioration in mental state. We go back to skills development. That's okay. We move with it. We're flexible. Yeah. But just always reminding our patients and the MDT where we are and mm. what we're doing moving forward. So that everybody is using that same yeah. really clear framework, isn't it? I guess it's it's easy then to work as a team mm. and for everyone to be looking at, at the same information as the patient is and, and working towards the same goals. Hopefully that gives us a bit of a, a typical journey and, and people a bit of a flavour of how that looks. If we think about the specifics, I know within the book you've included a case study, haven't you? So we we don't necessarily need to go into all the details of that. People can read it in there. But it might be nice if you just give us a a bit of an overview of, uh, of what that case study looks like. So we had a lady who, well, she was already in rehab, was in a different site, and then that site relocated to Salford. So her journey had already began, but it was felt that we need to start from the beginning again new location lots of changes need to go back to basics and she was quite resistant at the start so there was those sort of barriers to begin with um and we just looked at everything she was interested in what was getting in the way she was quite a motivated independent lady before she came into hospital so it was revisiting that do you want to be that person again is it going to look different and we worked through the pathway and in terms of looking at the pathway and looking at this case study she hit every milestone really of what you would want from rehab so she started with engaging all the groups getting more confident in the community then it was self-medicating from an ot perspective she got a job with us and then we have flats on site as well she moved into a flat and it was just very clearly moved through the pathway and it was fantastic Mm. and she's now um uh, successfully uh, discharged and into the community and her package of care is minimal um which is lovely because that's without that period of rehab mm. i do don't i don't i don't really think that she may have um been as successfully independent as she is um and she's she's now got employment self employment now in the community and things like that um she does a lot of work with signet as well um so yeah real success story um not always um linear Sometimes we'd have to go back and forth through the the pathway, um, but just uh, really nice to see her achieve that, especially as she'd been in services for so long Mm. as well. And to now be living independently is a massive achievement. What a wonderful outcome. I mean, obviously for her, um, but for all of the people who've supported her along that journey as well, to see her come to that place that you've all been working so hard towards, uh, it must be really rewarding. Mm, She used to, one of the things that she used to say was, um, so what do I need to do on this model to get me out of here? Mm. So we would use it, not 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 so much as a bargaining tool, <laughs> but we would use it in a way to, um, uh, in like an incentive, mm. right? So if I do this, I'll move along the pathway. If I move along the pathway, then I'll be able to be discharged. Yeah, but you got to do these things first. Um, and that was a bit, of, that was a challenge at the beginning. And then it became, it became something that she thrived on. Yeah. She absolutely loved that then. So it was nice to apply the model to, and she, it was easy for her to understand. Yeah. It was patient friendly, yeah. um, and that that's key. That's really really important for our for our service users to be able to see a model, relate to it, and apply it to their own life. It's very mm. important that. How do you make sure when when you're doing that that it's clear to the patient that actually needing to do these things to achieve the end outcome it's not sort of jumping through hoops which sometimes can be what they think of you know if you sat there with a model and you're saying if you do x y and z that means you can move on to the next stage how do we make sure that they don't feel like they're just ticking a box to be able to move forward well we individualize our care um so although the pathway and the model is the same 
the ind- how the individuals apply to that is very different. Mm. So somebody's, we all follow that same pathway, but the things that the individual achieves throughout that can vary mm. to a multitude of things. Um, and it's not a one sh- uh, size fits all mentality. Um, otherwise, we would ne- we would never discharge anyone. Um, we need to think a lot more creatively. And as occupational therapists, we can do that. We can be creative in how we apply our approaches. Our care plans are extremely individualised. Um, and this is where your clinics come in yeah. really handy. Yeah. So once a month, you meet with the patients, reflect on their occupational performance throughout the month, mm-hmm. getting them ready for ward round and setting goals. Mm-hmm. And I always encourage them to reflect on that month quite a lot because mm. if you're thinking, I've done this, so therefore I can move on. But how good do you feel for being able to do that? Don't you feel mm. better that you've got up this morning and, mm. and I've not had to you know, knock and get you up all morning? You've done it yourself. Does that not feel nice? Does it not feel nice to be a, mo- a lot more independent? And so them- focusing on those positive yeah. side effect really yes. isn't it yeah you know and what? sometimes it, it might be really difficult because i think because it is such a long journey rehab it's encouraging that reflection to think you know what even though they are sorts of differences they are happening and everyone's noticing it and it feels good and i am actually making changes mm-hmm. and that's how i always try and encourage people to go through the pathway but not it mm. be transactional i'll do this and this yeah. can happen mm. so that's the risk sometimes isn't it so For anyone listening to this who might be a newly qualified OT or a student thinking that perhaps they want to go and work in that mental health rehabilitation service line, what advice would you give them? Uh, yeah, so I'm a newly qualified yeah. OT and started in rehab and I think it's the best place to start. I think because, like I said before, you go through the whole OT pathway but at quite a slow pace. Mm. You can really take in all the assessments, all the interventions you want to do. You've got the time um, mm. and you've got the support as well. We've got, you're quite lucky in rehab. We've quite a, a big OT team. Why would you want to work in rehab? Well, why wouldn't you? Mm. You know, it's absolutely fantastic. It's OT led. You know, it's not medically driven. Um, it's very holistic in its approach and um, the MDT are very on board with that as well, particularly in Signet. Um, they have a really, really good um, the, uh, overview of what it takes for an individual to be well. It's not all about the medication, um, particularly in rehab. Um, and that's where you can shine as a therapist. You can be the OT that you want to be. You've got the time. You've got the resources. Um, I mean, we're so lucky. We're so fortunate. We get budgets. I would tell people about that. I would say, um, you know, you don't worry about scrimping and saving for a, a breakfast club that you would might have to, you know, feed a, a ward of 40 people on £10 a week. You have a, you have a nice, decent budget where you can truly f- uh, identify what it is that's important to the individual and you can make it happen. And working in, in definitely in Signet Rehab Services, you have the tools to be able to do that. You can be the best OT. There's no restrictions. Um, and you, you, you're you also able to uh, participate um, and involve yourself in changing or adapting that service line by participating in the CPD um, days that we have throughout the year, which happen um, at Signet. Um, and um, you are your own, you, you know, you, you input into your assessments, you input into your interventions, you can share best practice amongst other colleagues and you are hugely supported. Um, I would um, encourage any new band five uh, to start their journey in rehab um, because it's where you can really be an OT. And you've got the time as well. I think in other services, it's so quick, the pressure's yeah. there to, and you don't always have the the time to really get to grips with because you're still finding out who you are as an OT, mm-hmm. aren't you, when you're newly qualified? You don't have the time to do that where I think in rehab because it is that slower pace. You can sit and think, right, what do I like? What support do I need? And mm-hmm. It's just a lot more manageable, I think, mm-hmm. as well. That's great. Anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners or viewers about your experience working with that patient group? Um, I suppose um, looking back over my experience in my own career, I've worked in acutes, I've worked in um, A&E crisis teams, um, elderly, you, you know, you name it. Um, and when it comes to specialising, um, 
it was only ever going to be rehabilitation um, for me. Um, and luckily I was able to do that. Um, and the reason why I think um, it's important for OTs not to brush over this when they're considering it as a career um, is because when you do it it's 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 mainly about the time frame I think, um, where in in acute and fast paced environments or peak environments or things like that, you have the element of risk. It's very fast paced. You have to think on your feet, um, and that is very important skills that you need to have um, as any clinician really. But in rehab, you have that time um, to be able to consider um, what it is that's important to the individual, how you then form your interventions around that and then practice it. You've got that length of time to practice, practice, practice um, to then be able to have a successful discharge. Because sometimes um, you might not be able to see the person through the journey. They come back into services. You've got the time to dedicate to them so that whenever you do say goodbye, you're saying goodbye knowing I've done all of these different things um, to help them be as independent as possible. April, anything else to add to that before we finish? I absolutely love the service line. I love rehabilitation. So I started as a support worker, then was an activity coordinator and then moved into occupational therapy. And when I was doing my training, I, I knew that rehab was the the right fit. Um, the reason why, I think, because it's therapy-led and rehab as well. So every patient gets occupational therapy, where in those service lines, it might be that they're referred and you think, oh, actually, I think they have got occupational needs but I can't meet them at the moment because this I haven't got the time I've got other patients that take priority with rehab everyone gets that so when it's ward rounds or CPAs whatever it may be you get to have your input and I think that's so important because in a lot of services you might not have the chance and the OT yeah. voice is so strong yeah in rehab services um it's love. It is nice yeah. that our our profession is so valued. Um, it's the bread and butter of OT. And as a newly qualified occupational therapist as well, you can suffer with imposter syndrome sometimes and think, "Am I doing the right thing? Am I not?" And when you're in rehab, because you're always getting that practice and you're always having that involvement, I think it grows your confidence tenfold. And I think if you then move on to another service line, you've got that, like you said, good foundation, bread, good foundation to be mm. able to move on with. Yeah. So that would be my final take. That's lovely, thank you. Donna, April, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great to chat to you um, and I'm sure it's been really helpful for people just to find out a little bit more about what it's like working within those services. They will be able to get more of that information when they're reading the book and there's a lot more detail in there from, uh, from the chapter that the two of you wrote along with the other OTs in your service line. So thank you again for giving people a little bit of a taster of that. It's been great for you to join us. Thanks thank for having you. us.